We had a German exchange student years ago when our son was in high school. Nicholas was a great guy, and his English was really pretty good. He was doing the best he could to learn. But one thing that he just could not handle was the different uh, terms we have for groups of animals. For example, we have a gaggle of geese. You know, we have a pride of lions. We have, um, what else do we have? We have a, um, a troop of monkeys, you know, and it just blew his mind. But there were a few more I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> Some of the lesser known terms for groups of animals are, and I love this one, a wake of buzzards. We have a wake of buzzards. I hadn't heard that one before, but it's very appropriate, isn't it? How about this one? A shrewdness of apes. And my favorite, a bloat of hippopotami. <laughs> and finally, an implausibility of gnus. An implausibility of gnus. I guess that means that uh, no gnus is good gnus. That was bad, I agree. On June 16th, 1858, Abraham Lincoln was making a bid for the Senate seat for the state of Illinois. His speech included the following thoughts about the existence, the extension of slavery in what were going to be the new states of the United States. He wrote, or he spoke in his speech, he said, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. In my opinion, the issue of slavery will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government of the United States cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Though he was nominated by the Republican Party, he lost the election to Stephen O. Douglas, his opponent. Though many believed, his friends believed it was too radical a sermon. It was very strong for that time because many people, of course, were uh, against or for extending slavery into the new states. But he was ultimately correct and signed the Emancipation Proclamation, making us, at least in theory, one nation again. After appointing the 12 disciples, Jesus was exhausted in the story that we have today. And we don't know exactly what the nature of his, um, um, uh, what, what, his, what exactly his problem was when they said he was beside himself or out of his mind. We don't exactly know what that was about. Did he have some kind of psychological break? Um, did he become so depressed and anxious about the division in his own community, about what the kingdom of God was and what it wasn't? Did he become very discouraged about his mission that he had been given to do and his difficulty in carrying it out because of the resistance that he received pretty much every day and everywhere he went during the course of his ministry? His mother and his brothers and sisters had heard about his difficulties and like all good families and all good mothers and siblings, came to him to try to help him, to take him home, to give him a respite, or because they didn't want him to be a public embarrassment to them as a family. This happens sometimes, does it not, when folks who have been struggling with depression and anxiety don't feel comfortable many times saying what their condition is because the family will not understand and the community will not understand when folks have difficult emotional and psychological issues. And the scribes were there to judge what he had been doing. Now, Jesus had been healing. He had been uh, casting out demons and doing all sorts of things that were good. Casting out demons is particularly the thing that they had a problem with him about. And so they said, he must be casting out demons by the power of the de demon, by the power of Satan. And we have the wonderful retort, which is Satan can't cast himself out. He would be working against himself. He would be, having, he would be at war with himself. He would be divided. And so the scribes are slammed by Jesus for their lack of belief 
and their willingness to believe that healing could possibly come from anyone other than God, the Father. And this was a terrible insult against God to say that God was Satan. Evil cannot cast out the fruits of evil because it exists to create evil. The division of the scribes from God is made plain. They have shown themselves to be essentially devil worshipers, radically evil. A side note on the unforgivable sin. Sometimes that disturbs people. In the past, folks have asked me, well, maybe my problems are because I committed the unforgivable sin. According to this, the Gospel of Mark, the only unforgivable sin is to call Christ the devil. I don't think any of us have done that. I suspect that no one we know probably would say that. Yet we know the presence of, of evil is among us. All we have to look to is the federal government to find that at work. Federal government's never perfect, of course, but then there are times when we're way over our quota. Now, Jesus' family had been trying to get to him, but the scribes interrupted. So now the family, his loving family, comes to him and says, we come to take him away. <laughs> and he says, you are not my family in the way you ever were before. Who are my mother and my brother and my sisters except those who do the will of God? This is amazing. We can't begin to understand in our situation what that means. To say that you're rejecting your family or not putting them at the top was completely to blow their social structure apart. Family was everything. I mean, folks didn't move like we do and go different places away from our parents. You just didn't do that. But he was saying that your family is not important. Uh, what can we say? I don't think we even have an equivalent in our culture of that, something we are so committed to that we, we could never leave it. We try, we try to imagine what that would be like. That would sort of be like throwing out the Constitution. That would sort of be as serious as throwing out the Declaration of Independence. It would be something like that, of that severity. And then he says, the family of God, the kingdom of God is not about citizenship. It is about fidelity to the presence of God acting in the world in everyone, in everyone, the poor, the afflicted, the unjust, the, that are treated unjustly, those who are depressed out of their mind, those who have all kinds of afflictions, who are not at the top of the heap, who are not 5% of the 1%, 1% of the 1%, whatever. In that day, being a Roman citizen brought you tremendous privileges. Not everyone who was born was a Roman citizen, unlike our system where if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen, automatically. No, 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 no. Nothing like that in Rome. You ha if you weren't born of a Roman family, you had to do all kinds of crazy things and jump through all kinds of hoops in order to get citizenship. If you had citizenship, then you had the franchise. Then, like St. Paul, who was a citizen, you could appeal to Caesar, to the highest court in the empire, as it were. So, Jesus was comparing the kingdom of God with Tiberius Caesar. Who is the true emperor? Who is the, the ruler that transcends all? And who are his subjects? But you and I, those children who have been separated from their parents, those who are dying by the violent hand of ISIS and other terrorists, the citizens are those who are addicted, who are suffering, who are no account in our society, who have no power. They are children of God and citizens in the kingdom of God. Jesus was doing this to Caesar. 
Caesar, the most powerful person in the world. I was going to say something else they did to him, but that would be vulgar. He slapped him, is what he did. And said that we are citizens of the kingdom. Now, the kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And I don't know, but in my lifetime, this is the most divided I've ever seen it. The divisions between us, between right and left, between Episcopal and those who want to be or think they are, between black and white, between Native American and whites, between Hispanic folks and those who despise them. And it is not clear to me how these divisions will be healed or when they will be healed. I don't know. I try not to be a cynic, but something tells me it might get worse before it gets better. But to be healed, first of all, is to recognize our own capacity for evil. That's very important because I might get the idea that somehow I'm righteous, that my ideas count for more than other people's ideas. Now, there, now there's, there's give and take there, but the point is, is that whatever makes for more life, we must include within our thoughts. Whatever makes, whatever brings people together and heals divisions, that's a good thing, whether we're Christian or not. But at the very least, we as Christians should embrace that at all circumstances and at all times because each of us has a dark side, we do, and to deny it is to deny the truth. Sort of like this, to use a positive metaphor, a tree grows tall and beautiful because it's connected to the black, dark earth where all the nutrients are. That's the part that's hidden beneath the surface. But if that energy coming up through the roots is misdirected, then what results is not going to be a beautiful tree. It's going to look a lot like thorns and brambles and all kinds of things that will tear the meat off of you. When we know and recognize our own darkness, our capacity for evil, then the energy can flow. That's fear of God. The fear of God in me is that I might actually act in a way that divides and not heals. I suggest that that is what we could think about and make part of our goal in our lives, is whatever brings folks together is of God. And if it separates, we need to take a good look at where that energy and where that idea is coming from. Because there's enough struggle in life, isn't there? Just part of being mortal means that we struggle, we suffer, we experience death, death of loved ones. We have challenges that seem insurmountable at times. We have serious illnesses. Life is hard. And we sure don't want to be adding any more to it. And the way not to add any more to it is to bring folks together to share our sufferings, to share our sorrows, and to know that we are not alone. Now, I know we're stunned and appalled to hear the news of two very well-known people who have decided to end their lives by their own hand. And I think we're appalled to hear how our culture is experiencing more suicide than ever before. Now, maybe it's a function of statistics, that we have better statistics now, and so we have a better idea about who is is doing this to themselves. But it could also be, could it not, that our culture is so divided that when people look around and they say, it's starting to get hopeless looking. What is my place? What can I do? Am I powerless? Is there anything I can do against this contagion, this malaise, that has struck our family. I don't know about you, but if we watch TV long enough, it can, it can get pretty bad because all we hear is the bad news, almost always. Makes us upset, makes me upset, maybe not you, but it makes me upset and anxious when I watch the video news going by. 
Where's the good to counterbalance that? I have to ask myself. Well, the way I handle it is I just, when I read, I read online. I don't, I don't watch the videos. I just read. That way it's not as violent and in my face. And so these folks, their own spirit is divided against himself, or is divided, is it not? And so Hamlet's very famous soliloquy begins with to be or not to be. And when you get down to it, if you've worked with people who have experienced depression and anxiety, that is the question. And that may go on for days. It may go on for years in their lives. That is the question they wake up with. Some of our professionals here know about that. I believe I'm stating it as the case is. Some folks have a genetic predisposition, we know. And some folks' circumstances catch up with people. And before they know it, they're into a depression and a dark hole. It doesn't do any good to say, oh, snap out of it. Uh Uh-uh. This is way beyond anything like that. This is when someone can't see a pinpoint of light at night in the sky. I would ask at this time, take a little risk, how many of you here have had experience with folks who have killed themselves or almost did, whether a family member or someone of your acquaintance? Touches virtually all of our lives. Me too. Oftentimes these folks know how to hide their depression too, don't they? They don't look like they're having any problems. They look like things going along just fine. And if you ask them, they say, oh, I'm fine. Maybe it's better if we assume that folks may not be doing well, even, well, I don't, I don't want to put that too strongly. But let's not assume that everyone who says they're fine are, is actually fine. And if they were to take the risk and to say to one of you, one of us, You know, I would just as soon end my life today as anything else. We've got to get comfortable with the idea that someone might express that to us. And then to have some sort of sense about how to get that person or a a way, a process to be able to get that person to a safe place, first of all. And like with abuse, believe them. And don't try to put a Band-Aid on it. Oh, you'll be fine. No, they won't be fine. That's just what they feel like at that moment, right? Say, take them seriously and say, I want to get you to a safe place and not be alone. To believe them. Now, maybe sometime, if the congregation feels like doing it, we'll get together and have a bit of a conference or a discussion about ways to recognize that kind of a depression, suicidal ideation, and to talk about ways to address that when you bump into somebody that you expect or think might be depressed severely. And I would welcome to hear that if you think that would be a good idea sometime. When we are working to heal the divisions, we are doing the right thing. We are helping to bring the kingdom to all people and to re, it, renew it among us. And we must not let our drive to prove ourselves correct guide our ministry or play as if everything's going to be fine. If we are members of a church, then we do ministry in the name of Christ. And let us do so with awareness and train ourselves in this most important and timely ministry. 